Hey there, so um, I'm in a dialogue with a pastor friend of ours uh, who's been visiting our channels for some time and um, he's uh, a grace guy and he's one of the only grace pastors probably in Utah, if you can imagine. He's, he's got a small congregation uh, in Utah surrounded by Mormons. Um, it's, you know, not easy. Um, and the community here is really unique. He does appreciate the grace, uh, teachings, um, and also appreciates the community. And he has been expressing some concerns about the first John one nine thing because he's not sure where we're coming from with it as far as the biblical stuff. Um, and we've had conversations about it on the walls a few times, but the walls are hard because, uh, honestly, you say one thing, then the other person says one thing, and then that spins up three more questions. Uh, your response spins five more questions, and it just goes on. And it, it's, And he knows that we are thoroughly in our position, and we're not going to change our mind. And so there's kind of a feeling of futility on the walls. And this is one of the reasons I don't engage with debates on walls. It's just absolutely futile. And our, you know, YouTube is a weird phenomenon because uh, you don't act like a normal person on YouTube. Um, when you have a channel, uh, this is crazy wild west out there. And I always use the example from Monty Python, uh, Life of Brian, where uh, the guy, uh, he falls out of a window. Everybody thinks he's the Messiah, but he's just Brian. He lives down the street from Jesus. <laughs> uh, but he falls out of the window and he lands in a bazaar, a marketplace where people are hawking all kinds of goods and food items and everything. And uh, back in those days, you also had false prophets standing on, or, you know, preachers uh, standing on boxes yelling at everybody. And so he finds himself standing on a... Uh, box and he's hiding from the Romans so he's got to act like he's preaching and there's just one guy after another saying just the most outlandish and ridiculous things from their box and people just sort of standing in front of the boxes and listening and eating the fruit and buying fruits and uh, listening to the nonsense of the false prophets from each of the platforms and uh that's a picture of what it used to be like the marketplace. Paul would go into the marketplace and there was a riot almost every time he did. It is not a place for fellowship because in that situation, you are shouting to be heard over the din. If you really are convicted that the message that you have needs to get out uh, and you, you are shouting over the din of all the other false prophets to a ever shifting crowd that doesn't just stand at your box and listen to you, but moves around and hears contradictory messages from the other prophets <laughs> and uh, gets a mix of messages and and they're all confused. Um, it's not conducive for trying to have a community. It's not a community. <laughs> I've said many times, it's an algorithm. Um, and we let it get heated, you know. Definitely, I've said before that some of these conversations, if we were just at Denny's, uh, somebody would say something weird and you'd just say, okay, I'll pray for you. I'll see you next week. You wouldn't confront it and, you know, make a scene. But here we're called to do that. That's actually what we're called to do. Um, just like Paul, there was a difference between the living room and the marketplace. Or for Jesus, there was a difference between the temple where the religious people were and Bethany. You know, this is not Bethany. YouTube is not Bethany. It's either the marketplace of ideas or uh, people have come to hear a new thing or and some people are getting helped. And then people have personalities and uh, a desire to be the big thing and preserve institutions. And Alexander the Coppersmith is there and he was making money off this thing and now he's threatened by what you said. I mean, that's why it turns into a ride. Just read the book of Acts. 
Um, but God does send people into these marketplaces. And in those places, Paul was yelling at people. In fact, there was a riot um, in Ephesus, and he wanted to charge in there and just start yelling at all of them. And the apostles had to hold him back. They were afraid he was going to get killed. <laughs> so it's not for the weak of heart. I don't consider YouTube to be normal by any means. Anyway, I say all that because we're ramping up the volume on the first John thing. And uh, because of the stuff that's been going on, like I said, and he wasn't aware of all that stuff, but he's like, you know, how can you make this such a serious issue? Have you considered, and he gave me a bunch of arguments. Now, we've ha I've seen these arguments on the walls before um, from him, but we have not had a chance to really address it. So now we're in a dialogue going back and forth. And I said, I I'm, I'm responding to him in email, but he's actually interested. I said, can I make a videos about these? Uh, questions because honestly see, these are good questions and they're some of the things that I had to tackle while I was going through first John uh, and uh, he's the only guy that's actually picked up on the nuances with some of this stuff to ask the questions you know but his view is uh, just at the outset not different than ours regarding first John 1 9 but he's not marking a void territory because he's not weaponizing it. Uh, he's not uh, causing. He's he's not trying to be a lord chipper. He's trying to say, look, I'm not a lord chipper. You know, uh, I have the gospel right. I have. Uh, I'm a brother, but this is the view. You know, now, in my view, a lot of it is from his seminary background. It's traditional teachings, but I was under the same teachings. Uh, so, and he's also familiar with Miles Stanford and some of these guys, but so it's a good dialogue. And I asked him if I could do a couple of videos based on his points. He had an email with like a whole bunch of points in it. And so I said, I was just going to address them one at a time because I'm really busy. Um, and I've addressed two so far in email, but I said I'd do videos uh, to help communicate it because sometimes you need it a couple of different ways. So what are we getting at here? Um, okay, so he says, uh, <clears throat> these are his observations, but he says, uh, he's, he's, he's basically taking first John one, seven through nine. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And now he makes observations about this, um, horizontal fellowship, which means fellowship horizontal means Vertical would be fellowship with God. Horizontal means fellowship with believers. It is dependent upon parties walking in the light. Okay. This passage, he says, cannot be unbelievers as they cannot walk in the light. Okay. So it be begs this question, is it possible for a believer to be out of fellowship with the body despite the fact that all are of one spirit and joined inseparably to Christ? Of course, it's possible. 1 Corinthians 5.11, the position is unchanged, but the condition is affected by behavioral sin. Can a member of the body be out of fellowship with the body, yet simultaneously in fellowship with the head? How can such a thing be? If finger is severed by my hand, it is by default severed from my head, therefore of uh, on is... Practically conditionally, one is pr practically conditionally out of the fellowship with the body of Christ is also practically conditionally out of fellowship with the head. Um, okay. Uh, well, let me keep reading. The next, this is point two, because I actually addressed three points. The next phrase, 1 John 1, 7, adds, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. This word cleanses is pre present tense, meaning continuous and ongoing cleansing. But I thought our sins were once and for all removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, he's kind of making a rhetorical argument. Uh, as you rightly quoted, 1 John 2.12. It becomes clear, as Miles Stanford taught, that there's position and condition for the believer. Two realms, one fixed forever, unchangeable, our cleansed position, and the other realm, our sinful condition, which is often out of sync via daily experience with our unchanging eternal position, the believer sins in practice and needs a means whereby to deal with these daily sins 
He is to walk in the light, and the light reveals his sin, which the confess which he confesses once the light reveals it to his conscious mind. According he accordingly he is walking in perpetual state of practical cleansing, having feet continually washed by Jesus and having fellowship with him. Third, the we of first John one seven is the we of first John one eight, and we of first John one eight is the we of first John one nine. One must use hermeneutical gymnastics to make the pronoun of 1-9 address a different group of readers than those addressed by the same in verse 7. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to address that one first. Uh, he says that the we of 1 John 1-7, and it, uh, I've seen this argument a lot. So, uh, I encountered it quite a bit when I first started going through 1 John, and I wanted to see what people said out there. That um, we, I, let's look at the verses real quick. And, you know, if this isn't interesting to you, you can skip it. But uh, these are questions that are important. Uh, first, one, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus cleanses all sin. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, what the seminaries have taught, and what the traditional Christian teaching is, is that he is talking about believers who can be walking in the darkness by not confessing their sins. And not confessing your sins means that you're walking in the darkness because you're denying you have sinned. And he's talking about believers. And the reason they say it's believers is because he uses the word we and includes the apostles and the church in the, uh, the, the term. He's not saying they, he's saying we, right? So that the argument is, is this is not talking about believers versus unbelievers. This is talking about the condition of a believer, but if you go back to the beginning of the letter, he says, that which was from the beginning which we heard. He talks about the word of life. And then he says, that which we've seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. This, then, is the message which we've heard and declare to you, that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. And then he starts the we. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, do not do the truth. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make a liar and the word is not in us. Now because it's we, it's got to be believers, right? But what I said when I went through John... First John, sorry. And what some have said this, but I don't believe that it's talking about believers. I, the we is all of us who have received the message. The message came that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And they are proclaiming this message, which is the word of life, which is really Christ himself. The word, the life was manifested. We beheld him. Uh, and now we seem and declare what we seem to declare. We declare to you. Uh, sorry, I'm a little tired. Um, that you may have fellowship with us. Okay, so how is the fellowship brought? It's through the announcement of a person, which is Jesus Christ, and his work. And this is called, in John, the word of life. And it's also called the seed, in, in 1 John 3. And it's also called the testimony of God concerning his son, in chapter 5. Um... And it's the gospel. It's a, that is, those are all words for what, for what Paul would call the gospel. What does the gospel declare? Well, God is light in him, and there's no darkness at all. <laughs> but it also declares that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Christ. Uh, he came by water and by blood. He is the advocate and the propitiation for our sins. And not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. And those are all the things that... For, uh, uh, John says that the message declared. Now, who did the message come to? 
first to the apostles, and then they're announcing it. Why are they announcing it? So that you may believe it, receive eternal life, and have fellowship. The fellowship comes from the life, and the life comes from believing the message that's announced. Now, as the apostles went out with the message, did everybody believe it? No. So then there are two groups that have heard the message. At that point, at that time, there were plenty of people who had not heard the message. He's not talking about them. He's not talking about the world in general. He's talking about the message came, okay, and then there are people that, re that heard the message. But how did they respond? Did they all respond the same way? No. Um, now, when he says we, if we say we are uh, walking, uh, have, have fellowship with him and are walking in darkness, we lie and the truth is not in us. Okay, now, to, this is already problematic because uh, at first we were just talking about is 1 John 1, 9 saying that a believer practices confession of sin. But in order to embrace that, you have to say that the we is us, all the believers. Therefore, when he's talking about not saying we have no sin, he's talking about a believer denying that they have sin. And therefore, he says when a believer, or when, when we walk in darkness, he's talking about a believer that could walk in darkness. And it's assumed by the seminaries um, and traditional Christian teaching that the darkness means that you are lying about your sin and not confessing it, and that the darkness is sin. But John defines the darkness for us in the epistle. In chapter 2, he tells us that he who hates his brother is in darkness even now. Um, okay, so a genuine believer reading this epistle thinking that the we that he is talking about uh, is us, the believers goes on to chapter 2 and says, Oh, I may be walking in darkness. He's already read it in chapter 1. And he's thinking, well, what do I need to confess? <laughs> and he's like, wow, do I, do I love the brethren? Well, usually your answer is no, because somebody's getting on your nerves. And that would be the case if John didn't also define what it means to love the brethren. And he does in this epistle. Um... Now, John, uh, the pastor was saying that we have to execute hermeneutical gymnastics to make the we in these verses be different people. Like, sometimes he's talking about unbelievers and sometimes he's talking about believers. We're not. We're not doing that. What we're saying is that John is saying that we includes all who heard the message regardless of whether they believed it or not. And then the epistle bears it out that he's talking about two groups of people. One received the message and one rejected it. But both of them are responded to the message. When you respond to the message and you reject it, uh, that's different than just being out in the world um, and not really hearing the gospel because you never gave it heed. This is talking about antichrists who seduce believers and bring them into bondage. And they are biblically literate. They've heard the message. They know the message. Okay? It's been declared and they know it. And they, with knowledge, reject Jesus Christ and will not confess that he is the propitiation of the sins, that he came in the flesh, that he is the Christ, that his work is effective. And furthermore, they hate the brethren. Um, they're of the world. They're like Cain. They're like the evil one. They're of the evil one. Now, the darkness here, if you think it's just sin, he's saying if we, we have to do gymnastics in order to say that the we in these different verses is different. Like sometimes it's talking about us and sometimes it's talking about unbelievers. No, you really don't have to do any gymnastics but what you do have to do gymnastics to do 
is to say that the darkness in chapter 1 is simply a matter of sinning and not confessing it. When he clearly tells us in chapter 2 that the darkness is hating the brethren. And when you think, well, can a believer hate the brethren? He goes on into chapter 3 and says that we should love one another not as Cain, who is of the wicked one. He's the evil one. And he hates the brethren. He hated Abel. And he tells us then, he says something very scary. He says that uh, if, a, if you hate your brother, you say you love God, but you hate your brother. How can you, he says that in chapter 4, but how can you love God who you've not seen, but hate the one you do see? Um, but he says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer and does not have eternal life. And this is where the Lordshippers tell you that you're not saved, even if you do believe the gospel. I kind of covered this in the last video, but by uh, believing that he's talking about us here, and you establish that line of thought, you have to carry that line of thought throughout the whole epistle. Whenever he's talking about darkness, you have to do mental gymnastics to say that the darkness in chapter 1 is different than the darkness in chapter 2. He defines the darkness for us in chapter 2. Whoever hates his brother abides in darkness even now. He's in, he abides in death. He hates his brother. He's in eter he doesn't have eternal life. He's a murderer. This is the sin unto death. And to hate your brother is not just hating someone, or like not liking someone. It's as Cain. And Cain was of the wicked one and slew his brother. He was of the devil. Remember the parable of the sower. All the so the four uh, there were four soils, and the first soil was the seed cast by the wayside, right? And Satan and his angels took the word away from those who didn't understand it, the word of the kingdom. Then the next parable is the parable of the wheat and the tares. And the Satan sowed a counterfeit of the gospel to produce the tares. Most likely among the first kind of soil that thought it had received the gospel but didn't understand it, and Satan blinded their mind. Then when he blinded their mind, he gave them a replacement of false gospel. They think they believe. They think they love God. They think they know God, and they think they fellowship with him. But they hate the brethren. They walk in darkness. Okay, so you have to do more gymnastics to uh, say that the darkness in chapter 1 is just sinning and the darkness in t chapter 2 is something else. And if I say, well, if you say it's the same thing, then what do you say when I say, well, chapter 3 tells me that if I hate the brother, I'm a murderer and I don't have eternal life. Um you better have an answer for that or you're a lord chipper because <laughs> you can then you have to then say well it doesn't matter if you believe the gospel you are a murderer and you don't have eternal life if you hate the brethren and so love and the fruit uh it's a back load of the gospel where your the test of your faith is not whether or not you believe god's testimony concerning his son but, but whether you love now he said in his comments at first that a unbeliever cannot walk in light but john tells us and that's true but john tells us that a believer can't walk in the darkness in chapter three he says that the believer he who is born of god keeps himself from the wicked one the wicked one doesn't touch him in this way the way he touched cain because the seed abides in him. And a lot of people think that means that our regenerated spirit hasn't sinned, uh, they, and, and therefore we're not sinning. No. Uh, what it's talking about, the seed is not your regenerated spirit. It's talking about the word. The light came. The word, which is the life and the light. Right? In him was life, and the life was the light of man. That's the word of God. How do we receive the light? The entrance of thy word gives light. 
uh, and what is the light? What is the word? It's the gospel. It's God's testimony concerning his son. Where does the fellowship come from? God's testimony concerning his son that was delivered to the apostles and then preached as a message to the whole world so that we could have the fellowship. Uh, the fellowship comes from the light. And to walk in the light is to believe the gospel. Not, uh, not sin. Okay. Uh, believing the gospel puts us in the light. And when you ask the question, see, I used to think, oh my gosh, if I hate the brethren, then I don't have eternal life. See, this is real stuff. Uh, and I feared that I wasn't saved from first John, but I didn't see that later he says that the new commandment is true in Christ and in us because the darkness has passed and the true light now shines. And that commandment is to believe in Jesus Christ and love the one, love the brethren. They are two sides of the same coin, but you have to understand what loving the brethren means. It does not mean having warm feelings for everybody you see and nobody gets on your nerves. What it means is that when you see someone who has the testimony of Jesus Christ and holds it correctly uh, and can, can, can utter who Jesus Christ is accurately according to God's testimony, you know they're born of God. That's what he says in John, 1 John uh, 4. Um, beloved, he talks about testing the spirits, right? Uh, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. But you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He knows us. He knows God that hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Uh, now, who are we here? This is where they say, well, you've changed we. Because he said we in chapter 1, and now he's saying we. And that is true, that uh, we make a distinction. When he's talking about those who have received the testimony and are the sons of God, it's another group of we. Because we all received the message, all, you know, but how did you respond to it? Well, if you believed it, you're they. Or if you don't, I'm sorry, if you didn't believe it, you are they. You're the Antichrist. You're of the world. But if you believe it, you're of the children of God. And now you're we. So there's two groups of we. There's the ones that initially heard the message. And some said, I don't have sin. And they continued to walk in darkness while lying. And the truth is not in them. It's not that they're lying and they're, they, they have the truth in them, but they're covering it up. He says they're lying and the truth is not in them. And they don't say, sometimes, I didn't sin this time. They say, I don't have any sin. That's different. It's a very absolute confession. And he says they're walking in darkness. And then you say, well, that means that they're not confessing their sin. No, he goes on to tell you in chapter 2 that to walk in darkness means to hate the brethren. Okay, now there's two groups of people, definitely, that he's talking about going forward. He says in chapter 2, these things I write concerning those who seduce you. So there are people who are acting like believers who are seducing the real believers, and he's making a distinction. Now these ones who seduce the believers are not people who didn't hear the message. They are of the we that heard the message, but they received a counterfeit, they didn't believe the gospel, and they became terrors. They're antichrists. Uh, and they're seducing the believers and bringing them into bondage. But, and they deny the efficacy of the work of Christ while saying they have fellowship with God. See, if you don't take the whole book and you take chapter 1 alone and make it all about how to, how, you know, confessing our sin, and you know, I could see it. But then you dissolve the purpose of the book of John. These things we write to you concerning those who seduce you says that in chapter 2. Um, but uh, the whole point is that these antichrists will not recognize them as the children of God. They are of the world. He says they're of the world. The world came from Cain. And in chapter 3, uh, he says, in chapter 2, he says that he's the propitiation of the sins of the whole world. Uh, 
And then chapter three, he says, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us. Now, the world is not just the world in general. It's these who seduce them. Um, okay, now here, <laughs> who say they have fellowship with God, but walk in darkness. And look what he says. Now, brethren, I write no, this is chapter two. I write no new command to you. But an old commandment, which you had from the beginning, the old commandment is the word you had from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. He that says he's in the light hates his brother, even as darkness is now. Now he's talking about them, he. You know, first it was we. We all received the message. But of those people, if we were to say we have no sin... The truth is not in us and we're lying. If we say we don't have sin, that means we don't need the propitiation. It's the basis of denying Jesus Christ. It's the basis of Cain's sin. He did not believe sin could master him and that sin tainted everything. So therefore, he presented the toil from the ground of his labor, thinking that God would accept him on the basis of his works. Abel knew otherwise. He practiced righteousness. And offered the blood and the fat portion. He was justified by faith in the gospel. Abel was in the light. Cain was in the darkness. Cain started the world. The world came from him. But it's a, the world is religious. And these people who say they have fellowship with God, but walk in the darkness, lie. And the truth is not in them. And they say they have no sin. The next thing they say uh, is that he's in the light. And yet, he hates his brother. He's in darkness. Oh, well, that's a believer. You know, you can't say you're in the light if you don't if you haven't forgiven all your brothers. Okay, well, if it's really just talking about, um, you know, if it's really just talking about how you feel about your brothers, then maybe. But he, if you, he says he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. Knows not where he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He's blind. I write these things to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I write these fathers because you've known him from the beginning. I write you young men because you've overcome the wicked ones. I write to you little children because you've known the father. I write to you fathers because you've known him from the beginning. I've written to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. And you've overcome the wicked one. Love not the world. Why? Um, because if any man loves not the world, loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh-oh. Is he talking about us? He just said that we know the Father. How can he say that the love of the Father is not in him? What is the world? This is, you got to read my, I mean, this is too much. But the world is passing away, the less there of he that does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it's the last time. As you've heard, that an Antichrist will come. Now there are many Antichrists. He's warning them. Whereby we know it's the last time they went out from us. They're not of, they were not of us. For they've been of us. They would have no doubt continued with us. Now, these are people that heard the message. When he says us, he means those who heard the message. Uh, they went out from us and they showed that they weren't in the fellowship. Which means that they're the people who are walking in darkness. They went out to be manifested that they're not of us, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Well, you just said that I'm not dwell that God love of God doesn't dwell on me because I think I like TV too much. No, you got to know what the world is. The world comes from Cain, and it has to do with building up an identity in your own righteousness and hating the brethren and not recognizing them uh, by the testimony. The, not re recognizing the sons of God. I have written you unto, unto you because you know not the truth, because you, uh, not, not because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. No lies of the truth. Who's a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? Now, this is a, he said in the beginning that if we say we have no sin, we lie. Or we, if we say we, um, yeah, if we say we are, have fellowship with him, we lie at, while we walk in darkness. We lie and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin, we lie. Uh, I'm, I'm butchering that, but 
the two lies he's already talked about are people who say they have no sin, and yet they say they walk in the light, which means, how could they? Because the light tells us about Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for our sins. You can't accept Jesus Christ and not admit that you have sin. Right? Uh, they did not. Now, here's the other thing they lie about. Who is Jesus Christ and what did he do? He is the Antichrist and he denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son has not the Father. And then he says, let that which there, therefore you heard abide in you, which you've heard from the beginning. Now he's bringing them back to the message. If that which you heard from the beginning remains in you, you will continue in the Father and the Son. Now the word there is abide. To ab we are to abide in where we started. And where we started was a message we received. Just like he started this epistle, that which is in the beginning, which we've heard. The word was in the beginning. Whenever John talks about the beginning, he's talking about what we received, which was the light, which is what brought us into light and caused the darkness to pass and the true light now shines and made us different from those who did not receive the light but rejected it and walk in darkness. We're not walking in darkness. He said the true light now shines. The new commandment is true in us and in him because the darkness is past and the true light shines. And he says, this is the commandment, that you believe on Jesus Christ and that you love one another. These things I've written to you that you, concerning those who seduce you. But the anointing which you've received from him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. The same anointing teaches you of all things. Uh, and what he's teaching you specifically is, who's your brother? And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, you may have confidence that it is coming and not be ashamed. Why did... Why would they be ashamed? Because the Antichrists are seducing them away from Jesus Christ and the message they heard from the beginning and back to law by boasting in their own righteousness and yet they don't even know God. They're using the law because they hate the brethren and they want to make sure that they know they're not saved. What Antichrists do is tell you you're not saved. The work of Jesus Christ is not complete. Uh, the blood does not cleanse you of your sin and believing is not enough. That's what, that's what the root of Cain killing Abel is all about. And that's the hatred. Um, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does righteousness is born of him. You go, oh, God, now I have to be righteous and love the brethren? I can't do that. Well, he tells us in ch uh, chapter 3, this next chapter, that Cain killed Abel because Abel's deeds were righteous. And so he tells us that the practice of righteousness has to do with the offering and believing in the propitiation for our sins versus the one who does not practice righteousness, who's the one walking in darkness and lying, but saying he knows God. See, these are religious people. This is the religious world. Um, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Well, now we're getting to the heart of it. The unbelievers, and we're not talking about the world in general, we're talking about those who heard the message and rejected it and received the counterfeit and became antichrists, who've gone the way of Cain. He's talking about the same group that Jude and Peter is talking about, who've gone the way of Cain. Their false brethren crept in unaware, seducing the saints. Uh, and he says, they don't recognize us. The world doesn't recognize us as the sons of God. But we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he will appear, he will be like him. For we will see him as he is. We know we'll be transfigured. But they don't recognize us because we're still in these sinful bodies. And they say, well, you sinned. You know? So he says, whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for the sin is the transgression of the law. Now, why would he say that? Because the false brethren at that time... We're using the law to bring people into bondage and using the law to say that they had no sin. And so he's saying, whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Uh, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him sins not. Now this is where people think that they are, you know, he's saying, oh, I don't sin. Uh, or if you do sin, you're not saved. Another backload. 
But what he's saying is, whoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. And yet he already told them that you know the Father. And you've known him who's from the beginning. So he doesn't contradict himself. He's saying that there's a group of people that sins. Okay. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteous is righteous, even as he is righteous. Well, uh, I don't know if I'm doing righteousness. Does that mean keeping the law? No. He that commits sin is of the devil. For he, the, he the devil, the devil sins from the beginning. What? Are you telling me that I'm a sinner? If I sin, I'm of the devil. See this. If you if you read First John one, eight through nine, seven through nine, and say that's speaking of we the believers, and when he's talking about walking in darkness and sinning, he means when you sin, you have to confess it. Um. And, the, and to argue that, they, they say, well, he has to be talking about believers because he says we. But by saying we, they uh, exclude all the divisions in the epistle. So now the we have not only sinned, but we're capable of walking in darkness, being of the devil, not practicing righteousness, hating the brethren, being murderers, and not having eternal life, and not knowing God. And not having the love of God dwell in us because we love the world. And that's how most people read this book. Because they assume it's talking all about the same group of people. Because he said we. So this is where they, um, by forcing that on the beginning and saying, well, you really have to do the hermeneutics to say that we uh, is not we. No, we all heard the message. You know, all the people that he's talking about here heard the message and responded to it one way or another. But it produced two very different groups. One came into the fellowship and one went out from it, showing they were never of us. Now there's another us. There's the us who are in the light and the darkness is past. We confess that we have sin, but we also confess that Jesus Christ is the advocate and the propitiation for our sins. Um... We are not liars, and we are not walking in darkness, and we don't hate the brethren, we're not murderers, and we're not committing the sin that he's talking about here. He that commits sin is of the devil, we're not of the devil, for he that, the devil that sins from the beginning. This is where people have to say, well, you know, that's talking about my flesh. No, he's talking about a group of people. He says, he that sins, not your flesh that sins. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his sin remains and his seed remains, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. What? Are you saying sinless perfection? Well, you must be talking about my spirit. No, he's talking about a specific sin. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever does not do righteousness is not of God, neither is he that loves his brother. Oh, so I have to keep the law and love my neighbor as myself. Is that what he's saying? No. Because he already told us that the new commandment is true in Christ and in us because the darkness has passed and the true light now shines. And later he's going to say, and this is the new commandment, that you love, uh, believe in Jesus Christ and love one another. But he says, for this is the message we heard from the beginning. Oh, we're back to the message we heard from the beginning. First, that what God is light in him, there's no darkness at all. Here it's that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother. Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Well, what did his brother do? He kept the law and loved his brethren. No. He offered the blood of the lamb. He became a shepherd to offer the firstling of the flock with the fat portion, and his offering was accepted. And he is grouped as one of the prophets and one of the righteous the first righteous, maybe, after Adam and Eve, because of why he's justified by faith. And see, this whole thing, I believe, is written in code um, because the Antichrist were booting believers out of the fellowship, out of the church, and that was a very dangerous time to not be in your community because it was the time of Nero's persecutions. And John didn't want to offend the wolves any more necess than necessary but he also wanted to warn the believers who the wolves are. 
Now, the key to understanding 1 John is understanding why Abel was justified. And I'll tell you, unfortunately, I don't think it's the case with this pastor, most pastors that I've heard teach that Cain was rejected because he didn't do his best. He didn't try hard enough. He didn't give God his all. And they say that when he offered the firstling of the flock, that was the, the best portion and he gave his best. They don't understand justification. They don't understand why Abel was righteous. And they're the exact kind of people that John is telling you are wolves. They don't understand the gospel. They've, re they've received a replacement from Satan and their terrors. Yet they've made themselves leaders like Diotrephes. And they are controlling the fellowship and they're in charge. And yet they're tares. What do you do? Well, you know that those who believe the gospel and actually receive the message will understand that Abel's deed being righteous was not law keeping. It was faith in the gospel. And the Antichrist will read it and say, see, I knew he was one of us. He's telling those dirty sinners to get to work. And that way he won't offend the Antichrists and bring more persecution to the believers while warning them what's going on. And that's why I wrote my book, um, First John Decoded, exposing the Antichrist right under their noses. He uses the commandments and the law and the practice of righteousness and these absolute statements. He writes them in such a way that if you're a lordshipper and a wolf, you're going to believe that he's talking and justifying you, and you're not going to be offended by it. And yet, if you're a believer in the gospel and you understand the gospel, you're going to know that he's actually exposing those guys. And he, you're going to come out from among them and be separate. Uh, why did he slay his brother? Because his deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. What deeds were those? The offering. He offered his works. Works righteousness. And it was based on a message. The old message that they heard from the beginning was uh, to love one another, not as Cain. Okay. Uh, they both responded to the message that Adam and Eve gave them concerning the seed of the woman and the shedding of blood for the, for the uh, covering of their nakedness. God covered them with skins, right? Um, but Abel responded by becoming a shepherd and Cain rejected the, Im the implications of the message and tried to offer the toil of the ground. Somehow he took the curse of God and turned it into a commandment that he was supposed to keep to please God. And that's what legalists do. They take the worst parts of the Bible and say, that's your Christian life. <laughs> All the curses are what you're supposed to be doing. And then they take the best parts of the Bible and make them into threats. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. What? I thought you were talking to me. I thought you said I'm the one who's supposed to not hate people. I thought we, we were talking to the believer. No. He says the world is going to hate you. Who's the world? Cain. The world is the Antichrist who went out from us. They were not of us. They were in darkness. They're lying. They don't have fellowship with God. Why are you letting them rule the flock? How did Diotrephes get in charge? He won't receive the apostles. He kicks people out of fellowship, out of the church who fellowship with us. Well, they're seducing the believers. Then he says, we know we've passed out of death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. A believer cannot abide in death. You say, well, I don't love my brethren. No, there's a definition of what it means to love the brethren. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has, it just gets worse and worse, has eternal life abiding in. Can you see all the way through here that he'll address them and say, you know God. And then he'll say, he that sins doesn't know God. <laughs> and then he'll say, uh, you know you love the brethren. And then he'll say, he who doesn't love his brethren abides in death. Is he talking to the believers and saying that? Or is he talking about a different group of people? Marvel not that the world hates you. Hereby we perceive the love of God. Because he laid his life down for us, we had to lay our lives down for the brethren. Now, 
whoever has this world's good and sees his brother have need and shuts his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? Now, this is exactly what Diotrephes and the Antichrist were doing. They were withholding from the needs of the saints when they kicked him out of the fellowship. They put him out in Nero's darkness. It was, a, it was almost guaranteed you were going to the gladiatorium. <laughs> you know, uh, that is shutting your bowels of affection and compassion towards a brother and not recognizing him. Because he says, marvel not that the world hates us and uh, now we are the children of God, only the world does not recognize us. Okay? Um, who is the world? It's these antichrists that are in the fellowship, even though they're not in the fellowship. They didn't leave physically. They just never, were never in the fellowship. Why? Because they weren't in the light. They didn't receive the light. They're in darkness. Satan has blinded their eyes. Whoever has this world's good need. Okay. And then he says, my little children, love less not love and deed, neither in tongue, but deed and truth. Hereby we know we are of the truth and will show sure our hearts for him. For if our heart is condemning us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, we have confidence before God. Now he's telling them that condemning your own heart is a source of a lack of confidence before God. But he told them in the last chapter, if that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Father and in the Son. And he says, now little children, let that which you heard from the beginning abide in you so that you may have confidence in the day of Christ. Confidence comes not from knowing that you are uh, sinless and keeping the law. Confidence comes from the gospel, from the light, from knowing that Jesus is the advocate and the propitiation for your sins. And that even though you're a sinner, you are justified. Confidence comes if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And we assure our heart with the gospel. Uh, whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Uh-oh, we're back under the law. No, this is the commandment that we believe in the name of Jesus and love one another as he gave us commandment. This is the new commandment in John 13 and here. He that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. Hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit he's given us. Now, what does it mean to keep his commandment? It means to believe. The message you heard from the beginning, he said, if that abides in you, you will abide in the Father and in the Son. Right? And here he says, if you keep his commandments, you dwell in him and he in you. So abiding in him is based on keeping the commandment and the commandment is not the law it's a message we received uh, P Peter calls it the holy commandment the commandment is that we should believe on Jesus Christ and love one another does that mean have warm affections towards every believer that slaps you in the face and takes advantages of you actually he's telling them look this love that you have from Jesus Christ the reason it's not working for those around you is because they're antichrists and they're not in the fellowship. And this is what happens to believers is they get in these mixed multitudes where the whole church is full of tares and they can't stand any of them and then they think they're not saved. No, God doesn't let you adulterate your love and love the world. That's what he's talking about when he says don't love the world. But when I was among those people, they said loving the world means you're not homeschooling your kids. And you're sending to public schools and exposing them to the world and you're doing that music stuff and you're watching TV. It, we have been too influenced by traditional Christianity that we don't understand this book at all. This is the commandment we should believe in the name of Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave commandment. Okay, that's the commandment. And he already said that the new commandment is true in him and in you because the darkness passes and the true light now shines. What is the commandment to believe in Jesus? And to love one another. What is the sin? To not believe, but to lie. And to hate the brethren. It's the full, exact opposite. And that's to be in darkness. What does it mean to be in the light? It's to believe the message, believe in Jesus Christ. And the, then the darkness has passed and the true light now shines and there's a new commandment which is already true. You believe in Jesus Christ and you love one another. And he who does that abides in God and God in him. And it's based not on your efforts, but on letting a message abide in you. Now, you can get caught up in the world 
uh, in the Antichrist system with all the unbelieving terrors around you and get all offended, what's the solution? Is it to con keep confessing your sin? You know, when I was among the uh, false believers who called themselves the church, my heart was offended every other day. And I couldn't let it go. I was like, why am I so mad? I can't. And I kept trying to confess my sin from 1 John 1 9 because I was afraid I didn't love the brethren, which meant I wasn't saved. But actually, he was telling me, don't love the world. They're of the world. They hate you because they're the evil one. They're like Cain. That's why you can't find any love in you towards them. Stop confessing your sin and let that which you heard from the beginning abide in you and believe that Jesus is the advocate and the propitiation for your sin and stop letting these people seduce you. Don't love the world. Don't love the world. Okay, he tells us don't love the world. The world is not just things. It's, it's a group of people that operate in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the fly, eyes and the pride of life. That's what moves them in their religious service in the name of God while they say they have fellowship with God but lie because they're walking in darkness and they hate the brethren and they're like Cain and they're antichrists and they're walking in darkness and they're abiding in death and they sin and they're of the devil and they hate the brethren and they don't have eternal life and they're murderers. Um, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether of God because many false prophets have gone into the world. Hereby you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh is not of God. Now I thought you said that those who uh, hate the brethren in sin and don't keep the commandments are the ones who don't, aren't of God. They're of the devil. Now you're saying all I have to do is confess? Which is it? <laughs> no, if you confess, he's the apostle and high priest of your confession. And that means that you believe the gospel, which means that you are born of God, and you have in you the seed, and you keep yourself from the sin and from the wicked one that we're talking about here, which is the sin of Cain hating Abel. A believer can't do that. You know, to, to be like Cain is to not only reject the gospel, not only say you don't have sin, and not only uh, to... Um, you know, just hate the brethren, but you hate those who testify that they are sons of God because they're born of God simply by believing. That makes you mad. That Abel's offering is accepted when your works are rejected. It makes you so mad you kill the brethren. And that's what the Antichrists are on the walls that come and tell, do everything they can to try to convince you you're not saved, you're not a son of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Not come in the flesh, not of God. He's telling them how to test. How do I know who's a false prophet? How do I know who's an antichrist? It's not what they say about themselves. It's what they say about Jesus Christ. We test by the doctrine. We're not to love the world. And we're not to love Cain. And we're not to love people who are liars and antichrists. Okay, we're supposed to make a distinction. But how do we know? All I can go by is what you say about Jesus Christ. Do you deny what we are commanded to believe? And then do you deny that those who believe it are born of God and are the children of God? Are you of the world and don't recognize the children of God? Now, beloved, now, what a privilege. Now we are called the children of God, only the world doesn't recognize us. Right? Because we we're not transfigured yet, but we will be like he is when we see him. Then we'll have the last laugh. Um, hereby know you the Spirit of God. Right? And then he says, You are of God. Wait, no, I thought you said I was the devil. Because I can't figure out how to love my brethren, and I know I sin. <laughs> uh, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you, in you he that is in the world. Who who have you overcome? These antichrists that are in your midst seducing you. They're of the world, they speak of the world, the world hears them. Who's the world? The Antichrist that come from Cain, who heard the message but rejected it and received a counterfeit in its stead and became terrors. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God. Uh-oh, here we go again. <laughs> but he that loves not God knows not God, for God is love. And this is manifested in the love of God towards us, because God has sent his Son that we might live, into, live through him. How is the love of God manifested? In the gospel. God commends his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's the testimony of God concerning his Son that manifests his love. And it's believing that testimony that his love abides in us. And we dwell in that love. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's what he said in John 2. Or John 2. If any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Even the world. But they won't receive it. Because they say they have no sin. Beloved, if God loved us, we'd love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know he dwells in him, because he, he's given us his spirit. We, now, how do we know we have the spirit? He already told us. You test it by the confession. How do I know I have the spirit? Because I profess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We have seen and testify, see? That the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. How do I know I'm born of God? How do I know I have the Spirit? Because we testify. Whoever that confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. That, per that person must also believe in Jesus Christ, have the new commandment, and love one another, and be out of darkness and in the light. Uh, we have known and believed that the love of God has towards us. We've known and believed it. Believe is the operative word there. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God, God in him. How do we know we dwell in him? Because we believe the testimony. But he's telling us that it's something deeper. We're dwelling in his love. Here is our love made perfect. How is our love made perfect? By dwelling in God's love. Does that mean we love? No, it means that he loved and we believe it. And this perfects our love so that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now we're back to this idea of confidence before God. Where does confidence come from? Well, it's from your heart not condemning you, but being assured that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that assurance comes from the gospel, not from confessing your sins. Um, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. There's all good news. We loved him because he first loved us. Now here, if a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. There's the liars again. For he loves not his brother, whom he's seen. How can he not love God, whom he's not seen? Is this a talking to believers about how to love people and love God? No. It's describing the difference between two groups of people. The Antichrists and the sons of God. The Antichrists are of the world. They hate the brethren. They're like Cain. They're murderers. They're walking in darkness. They're liars. And they hate, hate, and they're murderers. <laughs> and they don't have eternal life in them. And they sin, they're the ones who sin. This is the commandment we have from him, that he loves God, love his brother also. And that's based on the message we heard from the beginning. Then finally, 1 John 5, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now that's something we recognize. Everyone that loves begot, uh, him that begot, love him that begotten of him. Here's how we know the children of God and the children of God. Uh, we love, how, here's how we know that, that we love the children of God. Now, here's the question. How do I know I love the children of God? You keep telling me I love the children of God. Well, because you keep his commandments. Oh, I'm back to the law. No. The commandment is to believe in Jesus Christ and to love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, slew his brother. Why did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Are you going to do that? Not if you believe the gospel. Because if you can't... If you hate somebody because they believe the gospel then there's no way you believe the gospel you're in darkness you've not received the light by this we know we love the children of god uh we when we love god and keep his commandments for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous and we just studied this the not grievous there means literally it carries no burden it's not a commandment for you to do like a responsibility it's something that's true in you and in him, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shines. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, he already said you overcame them. The world is a group of people, these antichrists. 
You've overcome them because greater is he that is in you that is in the world. These ones that seduce you, these ones that hate you, marvel not that the world hates you. Yeah, there's a difference between you and the world. Don't love them. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that comes by water and by blood. Wait, who overcomes the world? He that believes. Right? And then here's more of the testimony. This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, or has testifies, because the Spirit is truth. Now, in the last chapter, he said, we know we love God, and we have test believed and testified that he's loved us. Uh, or we have believed the love of God. Sorry. Uh, he, he already mentioned the testimony. Uh Hereby we know we have we dwell in him because we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses testifies. Jesus is the Son of God. God dwells in him. He in him. Whoever believes that Jesus is Christ is the Son of God. In contrast to who? The Antichrist that don't believe, that deny, that lie, and yet they say they love God. And so it's confusing because they seem so holy and righteous. And they seem to talk about the law, and they seem to talk about righteousness and keeping commandments, and they seem to be holy, and yet they hate the brethren. He's pointing out the whole epistle, is a, the whole thing is, who is my brother? By this we know we love the children of God, right? We keep his commandments. Then he talks about the testimony, for there are three that bear record or testify in heaven, the Word, the Father, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Three that bear witness or testify in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the testimony of men, because you're believing these seducing antichrists who say they have fellowship with God, say they love the brethren, say they walk in light, say they love God, and yet they clearly hate the brethren, are walking in darkness, are antichrist murderer. They're of the world. They're tares. If we receive the witness of men, don't receive that. The witness of God is greater. For this is what God, he has testified to the Son. Now, this is the message we heard from the beginning. It's all about the word of life. That which is in the beginning, which we heard, which we declare to you. And why do we declare it? So that you may have fellowship with us. We declare the Son, and it brings you into fellowship if you believe it. He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believes not God made him a liar, because he's not believed the record or testimony that God gave his Son. It's that simple. There's two groups of people. Some believed the message when they heard it, and some didn't, and it produced two very different outcomes. This is the record that God has given us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has the life. He that has not the Son has not the life. These things I've written to you that believe in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, that you may believe in the Son of God. Now, if John is telling you here that he wrote all of this so that you have assurance that you have eternal life, then you can't be the people he's talking about when he says, well, if you don't love the brethren, you're not actually born of God. If you sin, you're the devil. If you hate the brother, you don't have eternal life. How does that produce confidence that I have eternal life? But to say that the we in 1 John 1, 7 through 9 is talking about all believers you have to say that this whole epistle is talking about all believers. Where do you make the division? Well, the division is how do we respond to the message we heard? We, in 1 John 1, is talking about the group that heard the message. One group walks in the darkness and denies they have sin. The other confessed their sin, and now they have fellowship. And in the fellowship, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them of sin. The, fel the cleansing of the blood is not through the confession of sin. It's in the fellowship. We walk in the light. To walk in the light is to believe the testimony. Okay, To dwell in God and he in us is a matter of letting that which we heard from the beginning abide in us. It's a gospel focus. It's not a sin focus. And this is consistent with what I teach all the way through about what is sanctification. They've got that wrong. What does it mean to... Uh, be renewed, and to walk in the Spirit. It's all about setting your mind on the things of the Spirit and what he bears witness to. When he bears witness that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the propitiation for our sins and our advocate, who came by water and by blood, okay, 
And the fact that I confess that accurately says that I have the Spirit. That's how you're to test whether I'm a child of God or a false prophet or an antichrist. He already told us how to test. Um, and then those who are born of God, we recognize them. And that is our love. Uh, and this is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now he's getting to say, look, if any man sees a brother that sins not unto death, he shall ask you, give him life to them that sin not unto death. But there's a sin unto death. I do not say that he pray for us. And this is where the pastors say, see, if you don't tithe and you don't go to church and you cuss and you look at duty bags, you may have committed the sin unto death. You know, and it's just like the um, Catholics that have mortal sin versus venial sin. God might kill you. No, the sin unto death is the sin that Cain committed because he's a murderer and eternal life doesn't abide in him. And the first death it caused was Abel's. The second is his own. It's a second death, actually, because he was dead in Adam, but now he's going to be dead at the lake of fire. Second death. And that's what Jude means when he says those who have gone the way of Cain are twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Um, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Okay, We know whoever is born of God sins not. But he that uh, is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Now this is a sin that the wicked one inspires. This is the sin in 1 John 3 that he says, who's born of God does not commit sin. This is a sin unto death. It's all the same thing. Okay, that's the thing. People just need to see that 1 John is talking about one thing. Everything he's talking about is different repetitions of the same theme. There's the world and there's the believers. There's the sons of God. There's the Antichrist. There's those who've gone the way of Cain and those who are righteous like Abel. They practice righteousness. They have the new commandment through in them. They recognize the sons of God. They believe that Jesus is the propitiation for their sins. And that is the light they walk in. And they let it abide in them. They believe the God, love God has for them. And they testify and confess, showing that they have the Spirit. And they can know they have eternal life. And they should have joy. But their confidence is being sapped by those who seduce them because genuine believers with their sensitive conscience read an epistle like this and think, we're not saved. Where do we get that from Antichrist teaching? Antichrists control the institutions. And that's where we get a lot of our doctrine. But that's not what John was saying. John was saying, no, you can know you have eternal life and you should have joy and you should have confidence and the love of God should pray cast out all your fear and no it's not that you loved him it's that you believe the love he has for you you need to just come back to the gospel that's what he says to the believers to the unbelievers uh, who received who heard the message their progress stopped at first john 1 9 when they wouldn't even confess they had sin and then they started walking in darkness and it grew into hatred for the brethren and they show themselves to be murderers. And they commit the sin unto death. And he's saying, I don't even want you to pray for them. <laughs> That's pretty strong language for the apostle of love. We know that the Son of God is true. Has come as true. He's given us an understanding that we may know him as true. We are in him who is true. His Son, Jesus Christ, is the true God and eternal life. And then he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. The way you can be seduced by the world is through idolatry which is substitutes for christ one of the idols is confessing sin where you think that fellowship comes through a practice called confessing sin no cleansing of sin comes with the fellowship while you're enjoying walking in the light and that is not a sin focus but a gospel focus and i don't have time to get into that now that's going to be the answer to one of his other questions but this is uh, this had to be the answer to the we. Are we doing mental gymnastics to say that we are not the group he's talking to when he talks about those who walk in darkness and sin? No, you have to do mental gymnastics and cut up the letter to say that we are the group he's talking to. It takes more because now you've got to address if I'm the we that's possibly walking in darkness, 
then that means I'm the we that could be hating the brother and not have eternal life and not be able to know I'm saved. And that is completely contrary to everything he says about why he wrote the epistle. He wrote it that we may have joy, that we may have a fellowship, and that we may know we have eternal life. And he told us how we can know. And I have all the attributes of someone who has eternal life, according to John. And yet, if I have wrong definitions about what the world is and what it means to hate the brethren and who he's talking to at the beginning and what it means to walk in the darkness, and I think that confessing the sins is the way to be in the fellowship, and if I'm not, I'm lying, then I'm also all the evil things that he talked about and I might not be saved, and you just don't know. A Calvinist or a Catholic or anybody who doesn't see this epistle this way cannot get assurance of eternal life from this epistle. If they think that they are in the group that can walk in darkness, then they are in the group about which he says all the negative things. It's all or nothing. Um, and you have to do gymnastics to keep yourself out of one group, but say we're, you know, we're the ones who have to confess our sins, but we're not the ones who don't have eternal life. <laughs> we can walk in darkness, but when he talks about, you know, sinning unto death, that's got to be somebody else. Or maybe that's us. You know, which is it? Well, your confidence is obliterated because of the traditional teaching on 1 John 1, 8 through 9, which is divorced from the rest of the book, and tells us that we are the people that can be walking in darkness. And they never teach the rest of the book. They just teach those verses. So then if the believers go home and they read the rest of the book, they start losing fear, or they start fearing loss of salvation or that they were never saved. And then the Lord Chippers come and tell them, yep, exactly. <laughs> you know, so it is a big deal. It, that's why it's a gospel issue. That's why it's worth fighting for and speaking to a lot. Um, this epistle, the most important book I read, I wrote was on 1 John. 1 John decoded, exposing the Antichrist under their noses. And for some reason, people aren't as attracted to that one. And maybe it's because they're scared of this book. See why? You know. So this is my answer to the question of the proverbial we. Who is we? We are those who received the message. Or we didn't, we are those who heard the message. Those who received it received the testimony of God's love for us, that he gave his son that we may live through him. And we were born of God, and we're the children of God. And we can know we have eternal life, and we should even have confidence in the day of judgment if we don't allow ourselves to be seduced. So we have an anointing that teaches all things, and we're to test the spirits. Because not everybody's our brother, and we need to learn not to love the world and not to pray for antichrists who are committing the sin of death. And stop confessing your sin when you really need to leave the church. <laughs> you know, if you're surrounded by these antichrists, the problem is not you. And you're, you're trying to repent of not loving them and hoping you're saved. And the more you're with them, the more upset you are. And they're brutal. They're brutal. This is liberating message. First John is a liberating message once you realize who belongs to which group. <laughs> you don't belong, if you are a believer, you are not in the darkness that John is talking about. And you have not committed the sin that he's talking about. You can't. You're not of the evil one. You're of God. He tells you that too many times. You know God. You dwell in God. He dwells in you. Uh, you should have confidence, but it, the, where does the confidence come from? Where does the assurance come from? Let that which you heard from the beginning abide in you. If you do, you'll abide in him and he'll abide in you and you'll be perfected in the love of God, which casts out all fear and will assure your heart. The assurance of our heart doesn't come from confessing sin and keeping a good record before God because all sin is transgression of the law and the law condemns everything we do. We can't live under the law. No, we live in grace under the gospel, and the Spirit bears witness to the gospel. Um, now, the other thing is that they believe, the people who teach this way, believe that the Holy Spirit's job is to tell you about your sins. No, he can fix the world of sin. But he, can, he bears witness to us of the gospel, always the gospel. 
Now, that's not to say that we don't have sin or that we are not um, sometimes brought to godly sorrow and stuff like that. But the whole time he is bearing witness to the gospel, that is the means that he purifies us. He who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. And according to Hebrews, that hope is an anchor for our soul that brings us into the presence within the veil. And that hope is based on the covenant that God made with Abraham's seed and David's seed when he made him our high priest. Our hope is fixed in the gospel, not on how well we've confessed our sins or whether we're sensitive to our sinful state or whether or not we have certain feelings toward the brethren that aren't even brethren. Turns out they're antichrists. <laughs> no. We need to get out of this focus on ourselves when we read 1 John and stop reading it as if he's trying to describe how a believer can walk in the light rather than in the darkness. He's not. He tells us very clearly what the darkness is in this scripture uh, in, the, in the book. And the only way you can get that the darkness is just sinning and a believer can walk in it and be blind in 1 John 1 is to ignore what he says in the rest of the book. It's the only way you can do it. So um, that's my answer to that question. And I'm tired. I got a recording session in the morning. I probably shouldn't have done this tonight. Oh my gosh. It says 81 minutes. Well, I just went through the whole book. Sorry. <laughs>